statistics etc and many other areas also and um, today he will talk about stochastic resetting and uh, this is the field also he's i mean i think the, there is a lot of research activity in this field but it was uh, started by satya himself for many people like me who know satya from an early days of our career like our phd times uh, he has been a source of inspiration and we are very really happy to have him here today as our speaker his um, uh, contribution in the field of uh, non equilibrium and non equilibrium statistical physics has been recognized by many awards including uh, eps uh, statistical and non linear physics prize gay lussac humboldt prize cnrs silver medal paul lanchfa medal etc and there are many more Uh, he also holds an adjunct professor position at uh, DTP in TIFR Mumbai and ICTS in Bangalore, and also Department of Physics of Complex System at Wiseman. So, with this, uh, I would like to invite Satya to uh, present the talk. Thank you very much. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you, Shakuntala, for the introduction, and uh, thanks to Urna and Shakuntala for for the invitation to speak here. And it's a great pleasure, and I, I really apologize. For not being able to present this talk in person, in spite of the fact that I'm in Calcutta right now, but you know, suddenly I developed a pain in my leg and I could not move. So sorry about that. I'm very sorry about that. So you can you can you can see the screen uh, fully. Yes, yes you can see. Yeah. Can. Okay. So uh, so today I'm going to talk about stochastic resetting. I mean. Uh, so this field essentially started about 10 years back and uh, and rapidly evolved into a very major area of research in statistical physics in the last few years and uh, so what i want to do is uh, to give you a sort of uh, sort of overview of this uh, developing field and some of the questions and uh, so of course i'll not be able to cover everything because a huge number of work has been done and it's not possible to cover everything in one hour talk so i'll be sort of selective in my choice and i apologize if i am not being able to cite everybody so right in the beginning okay so uh, so here is the plan of my talk so i want to first tell you a brief introduction i mean the the of stochastic resetting how it came about uh, and uh, and then i want to tell you about the simplest model that you originally started with uh, martin evans diffusion with uh, resetting it's a very simple model and it actually tells us few things like you know it, it gives us gives rise to a new non equilibrium steady state uh, it has an unusual temporal relaxation and the most important thing is that it has an optimal search time to find a target i'll explain all this as i go along and then i'll talk about some recent experiments using optical tweezers and then i'll talk about generalizations to many body systems and finally i'll just summarize and tell you some new directions uh, of research in this area okay so that's that plan so let's start with stochastic resetting so essentially this field of stochastic resetting was originally motivated by search problems uh, and as you know search problems are ubiquitous in nature so animals searching for food or a helicopter searching for you know uh, survivors after a ship wreck uh, or even protein searching for it, you know, DNA uh, to bind on a target uh, site on, on a DNA to bind. Or even when you are writing computer programs, I mean, when you are debugging your computer program. So all these are search problems. And in many of these problems, it's quite natural that if you have started this search, if you have searched for a while in vain without finding the target, you might want to restart the search right from the beginning and uh, start all over again. Okay. And the rationale is that if you start a new way, then you might find the target much more easily. So, for instance, I mean, you know, when you are looking, you are trying to debug the computer program, very quickly you might get lost into subroutines and blah, 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 whatnot. And, uh, and instead of, you know, still trying to find the bug, it might be a good idea to just to take a break, go for a coffee and come back and then restart from the beginning. That way you might find the, you know, bug much more easily. So these th notions are, were there already that, you know, that somehow that the restart uh, might uh, help you finding the uh, target much more easily. And this is actually also used in visual search. So for instance, I mean, if you are looking for a face of a friend in a big crowd, okay, so we never scan from one end to the another. Your eyes never scan from one end to the another. What it does is it, it just starts at some, you know, random initial point, and then it searches locally around it. 
and doesn't find it comes back to the starting point and then it restarts the search and looks in the neighborhood so this is and in fact the psychologists they do experiments with that so for example i mean you know psychology you know psychologists they show the patient a sort of a big board blackboard containing the letters p and amongst these letters there is one letter which is b and then the the patient is asked to find the b amongst all these p's okay and then they, they put a camera in the eye of the patient to see you know what is the sort of search trajectory and again you know it never scan they never scan from one end to the another one this this one is a small one cartoon one but typically again they start from a random point and then they search locally don't find it then they search again locally uh, come back to the starting point and again search locally and so on okay and uh, so if you look at the trajectories uh, so this is what it does so you know this is just a you know cartoon again so you start from some initial point randomly chosen and then from there you make you know just a random random walk essentially you just move random walk in space you don't find the target and then you come back to the starting point and then you restart the search that means you again start a new random walk and you perform this random walk and then you come back again and so on okay and uh, and the you know the um, the notion is that you know this is i mean somehow we do it empirically always now question is whether the, this is really efficient or not coming back to the initial point okay another area okay in case you have not find found the b the b is here actually okay so all right so the other area is that uh, you know when you are searching for a global minimum in a complex energy landscape we always do that in physics i mean uh, in many many different problems from spin glass to you know disordered systems magnets and in typical algorithm like simulated annealing so what you do is you know you start from an initial so this is the energy and this is a, some configuration space and you st so you start this energy landscape so you start from some point and then you just you know move in this configuration space by by making some updates in your configuration and as long as it lowers the energy and then you know what happens typically is that you might get stuck in a local minimum and then it takes a long time to get out of the local minimum to find you are searching for the true global minimum but to get there it's very very you know it's not so easy because you might spend a long amount of time long time in this beta stable configuration so people actually used to do this empirically that you know it, it sort of makes it beneficial to to start from you know go back to your starting configuration and restart the search and the rationale is that when you restart you might follow a different pathway and then you might find the global minimum much more easily okay so that's the sort of rationale behind it and again this has been empirically used for a long time but you know there was no quantitative estimate that how much does the reset uh, you know help uh, or does it help at all okay of um, of this uh, for this search process okay so that was our original motivation so we wanted to sort of investigate this um, in a very simple model to sort of make a quantitative estimate of whether the resetting really improves the search okay so so this was actually sort of the origin of our model 10 years back with martin evans uh, from the university of edinburgh and uh, we wanted to study the, this you know stochastic resetting in a very very simple model and this is just a, just a random walk or diffusion if you like yeah. and uh, and we want to see if this stochastic reset what does stochastic resetting do so to to so let me start with a very simple definition of the model. So and then we'll sort of uh, progress uh, progressively. So so here is the sort of uh, a Brownian motion. So essentially, okay, I'll talk about I'll present the things in one dimension for simplicity, but you can easily generalize to higher dimensions. Okay. So imagine that you have a Brownian motion on a line starting from some initial position x naught. For the moment, forget about the search. You know, just just think of the simple model. So this particle is just doing. So in my uh, you know talk everywhere, the horizontal axis will be space, and the vertical axis will be time. Okay, so this is a typical trajectory of a Brownian motion. So it diffuses for a while, and then after some random time, you know, you, you reset it back to the initial position x zero, and then again again the particle diffuses freely, and again after a random time, which is dis, you know distributed exponentially. With the parameter r, so the mean time between resetting is one over r, or r is the rate of resetting, if you want. You again go back to the initial point, and then again you sort of diffuse freely, and then again you go back to the initial point, and so on. Okay. So if you are doing computer simulation, this is very simple. So you say that if x of t is the position of the particle at time t, and you update it by the following rule. So in a small time delta t with probability r delta t, r is the rate. And R delta T is the probability. R can be anything from zero to infinity. 
So with this probability r delta t, you go back to this sort of new position after time t plus delta t becomes this initial position x0. And with the complementary probability 1 minus r dt, you do diffusion. That means you update your current position and you add a noise term to it, eta t delta t, where eta t is a Gaussian white noise with zero mean and the correlator, which is a delta correlator, and d is the diffusion constant. Okay. So r is the only parameter in this model, okay, given this d is just a fixed d, you can set it to be 1. So when r equal to 0, it's just a simple diffusion. And now you just introduce this resetting. And the first question you ask, you know, what happens to the particle position before even we come to the search problem, okay? So if I do this, what happens to the position distribution, okay? So that's the question I'm asking. PR of xt, so subscript r means uh, with reset. Uh, so what is the probability that the particle, probability density that the particle is at x at time t, okay? And given that it started from the initial position, x minus x naught, and undergoing this resetting dynamics, okay? Now, in the absence of resetting, when R is zero, then you know that the, you know, the probability distribution is simple diffusion. It's just a Gaussian centered at X naught and with the width, which is square root of 2 dt. So this is the, so now you ask, you know, what happens when I switch on the resetting, okay? So what happens to this PR of XT? That's the first question to ask. So what happens is the following. So it's very easy to derive this uh, result uh, with resetting. So let me just take you through how to do it. So what you do is just write down the focke planck or master equation, if you like. So del PR x t, del t, so rate of, rate of change of the probability density at x. So there's a diffusion term, del 2 x uh, PR, okay, d times this is a diff standard diffusion term. And then if you are at the resetting uh, induces these two extra terms, uh, so if you are at x at time t, then with rate r, you go away from the x to, uh, to x naught. So therefore, this is a loss term here, minus r p r of x t. And on the other hand, if you are at some other point x prime at time t, by resetting, you can come to x naught. So this is a gain term from other points. So you have to then sum over all possible positions uh, where you are. And this yeah. equation you have to solve with the initial condition that the, it's a just initially it, it is exactly at x naught. Okay. Now one advantage of this this uh, approach is that immediately you see that because of normalization, PR of x prime t dx prime this term here is always one by definition. Okay. So therefore you have a, even a simpler equation. So you have a loss term and you have a, just a source term gain term gain term if you like. Yeah. And you need to solve this equation subject to this initial condition, which is delta function at x naught, okay? And this is a linear equation. You can trivially solve it just by Fourier, taking Fourier transform with respect to x on both sides. Uh, so I'll not go through the solution, but the, you know, the solution is very, very simple. And so first thing it happens is that you can ask what happens to the steady state? That means when time goes to infinity, you can drop this term and you can just solve the right-hand side equal to zero. And by Fourier transform, you can just solve it. And what you find, Okay, before I do that, okay, before I come to the steady state solution, so you can solve it fully anyway for, uh, for you know, just for arbitrary time t. So I'm not going to show you the solu solution explicitly how to do that because just a linear equation, so it's trivial actually. But the solution, you can write it in the sort of suggestive form, which is the following. So this is the exact solution, and the solution has two terms, okay? So there is a first term, which is e to the power minus rt times P0 of xt, where P0 of xt is just a free propagator, which is just a Gaussian. And then there's an integral 0 to t, d tau r e to the power minus r tau times P0 of x tau. Okay. So you can check that this is indeed, this indeed satisfies this equation here with the correct initial condition. Okay. And you, you get it by Fourier transform. But this equation actually has a nice renewal interpretation. And this is this will be useful later. Okay. So what is the renewal interpretation? So let me sort of look at my trajectory, which is going from x naught to some position x at time t. So time is going this way. Okay? So this is at time zero. Now, you want the particle to be at x at time t. Okay? So now let's look back, backwards, okay, from time t. And suppose that tau is the time at which the, you know, the time counted since the last reset. So the, the tau is the time passed since the last resetting occurred before time t. Okay. Which means that in this time tau, there is there was no resetting. Okay. For any trajectory, I can always find the tau, right? So now you can interpret this following way. 
So what is the first term? So first term is, you know, it, it may so happen that between zero to T, you have no resetting at all. Okay. Now what's the probability of no resetting? It's just E to the power minus RT because this is the Poisson process. So probability that there is no resetting at all in the time interval zero to T is just E to the power minus RT. In that case, the particle just undergoes free propagation. So therefore, this is the first term which corresponds to no resetting event of the trajectory. On the other hand, if there is more than one resetting, more than you know, more than zero, that means uh, one or more resettings, and then you can actually think of this tau, which is the time since the last resetting. And you see that during this tau, there is no resetting. So this is a free propagation, P0 of x tau. And what is the probability that there is no resetting in time tau is e to the power minus r tau followed by a resetting event, you know, preceded by a resetting event uh, between time tau and tau plus d tau, which is r times tau d tau, because you remember that with probability r d tau you reset. And then this tau can be anything from zero to t. Okay. So therefore, you know, I mean, basically, you know, if you know this time since the last resetting, you can actually, you know, write, give a nice, you know, renewal interpretation of this, uh, of this equation, this solution here. Okay. And uh, so all you need to know is when was the last time it, 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 it reset. And because after that, it's a free propagation. Okay. So it involves, so the solution you can actually write down in terms of this, you know, zero resetting problem, free problem. Okay. So that's the main point of the renewal approach. So now you see that as t goes to infinity, how do I uh, hide? Okay. So as t goes to infinity, you know, this term drops out here and you just put zero to infinity. And this integral, you can actually easily do it. And what you find is that it, it actually has a stationary distribution, which is a pure exponential minus mod x minus x naught. And alpha zero is just square root of r over d. Okay. So so, so therefore, what you what you get is that a very simple result out of this, uh, you know, diffusion equation uh, re with resetting is that there is a non-trivial stationary state where the you know distribution is non-Gaussian first of all, and uh, and it is symmetric distribution of course, which has a cusp at x x equal to x naught at the initial position, and then it decays exponentially on both sides. Uh, so first thing to point out is that this is a non-equilibrium stationary state. Why non-equilibrium? Because you know, the, the, this problem has, uh, you know, even in the stationary state, the detailed balance is always violated because, you know, from a given position, you can always go back to X naught by resetting, but there is no reverse move. Okay, So it, it manifestly violates detail balance. Uh, and so even in the stationary state, there is a non-zero current flowing from one configuration to another configuration. And uh, so therefore, it's a non-equilibrium stationary state. And even though you can write the, you know, the solution, the stationary state as as exponential of and in a Gibbs form with an effective potential which is mod of x minus x naught, this is still not an equilibrium solution, okay? Because there is a non-zero current in the stationary state. Okay, so this is one of the simplest example of a non-equilibrium stationary state. You know, I mean, just a single particle problem. I mean, I, I find this very interesting that just a very very simple, you know, one particle problem. You know, you don't need any interaction, nothing. You know, just by resetting, you can generate a non-equilibrium stationary state which is uh, very interesting. And uh, so this result was uh, very recently was um, was verified in experiments on optical tubes, holographic optical tubes from the group of Tal Friedman in uh, in um, in uh, Tel Aviv and Arno Paul was also involved in this experiment. And, you know, they, they, they verified that indeed this uh, exponential, you know, e to the power minus mod x, x minus x naught behavior is reproduced in the experiment. Okay. I'll come back to the experiment later. All right, so this was the first question. And then the second question you can ask uh, that uh, what happens to the approach to the stationary state? Okay, so stationary state is very simple. So what, what about the time dependent, uh, you know, transient state when, you are, when your time is not infinite, but time is large? And how does it approach the stationary state? Okay, and this is, you will see that this is unusual temporal relaxation in the following sense. So you have the full exact solution. So you don't have to do anything. You know, you remember this is the exact full solution. So you just have to plot it as a function of time and see what happens. And you just analyze this integral essentially. Just substitute the Gaussian and analyze this integral by saddle point method. And then what happens is the following. What you find is, uh, just let me summarize the behavior. So again, this is space and this is time here. 
So in the space time, you know, uh, the, the, uh, to the space time one plus one dimensional thing. So this is your starting point x naught. So there is there are two light cones. That means you know there is a length scale psi of t which increases linearly with t on both sides. Okay, around the x naught, uh, which grows like square root of four drt. Okay, so there is like a light cone which is moving out ballistically from the origin. And in this purple region, that means if your x, so you are looking at PR of xt, if your x is, mod x is less than psi of t, that means you are in the purple region. So here, the distribution already achieves the stationary form. Okay, So, so, so this is the non-equilibrium stationary stateness. Okay, So for x minus x naught absolute value less than psi of t, you have already become, this. the solution has become time in, independent. Whereas... When x is x minus x naught is bigger than psi of t, you are in this uh, you know uh, green region or blue region or whatever. There, it still depends on time t. Okay, so this is the transient regime. So so this light cone actually separates the you know the stationary regime from the transient regime. And as time grows, the uh, the ness that means non-equilibrium stationary state gets gets established on a larger and larger length scales, if you like. Okay, so so this is a very unusual relaxation. Uh, and in fact, to characterize this, you can actually write down this full solution at late time t. So when x minus x naught absolute value is large, t is large, but this ratio is fixed, then you can write this solution. You know, I have given you the exact solution. You can just you know plug it in, and you see that it actually allows you to have a, a large deviation form. That means when the what is the probability that the x is very large compared to x naught? So then. It has this form. It's a, this t is the kind of you know for the rate of the large division. I is a non-trivial function, and this function i, which is called the rate function, so which describes how the PR of x t behave across this uh, as you go through this uh, light cone. So as long as your scaled variable, this y mod, is less than square root of four dr. Remember, I told you this is psi of t is growing linearly. So therefore, this is when this is less than four dr. That means less than y star. You are in the purple region. And there, this large division function is just absolute value of y. And you see that if it is linear, mod y, then the tt cancels and it becomes stationary. Whereas if y is bigger than y star, then it still depends on time. And there it has a different form, r plus y square over 4d. Okay? So which means that essentially, this function, if you plot, it has this linear form and then it sort of becomes a quadratic form. And uh, and it, it actually you can check that the second derivative of so the function is continuous at this at this point as you go through the light cone, its first derivative is continuous, but its second derivative is discontinuous at y equal to y star. Okay? So in that sense, this is a second order dynamical phase transition. So because the second derivative is discontinuous. Okay? So the relaxation, if you like, is rather unusual because you know typically I mean when we write down in any system. You know, you have a relaxation that you write down as sum over the relaxation rate, c to the power minus lambda i t. So basically, the system relaxes uniformly. But here, it doesn't relax uniformly. You know, you see that the guys here, they have relaxed much faster compared to the guys outside. Outside, they are still relaxing. So the relaxation rate, in some sense, you know, quote unquote, depends on x in this manner. So you see the relaxation time, this lambda, effective lambda, it actually depends on x. So in that sense, this is an unusual relaxation phenomenon. All right. So now I come to the you know, initial question I, I posed. That means, uh, what about the search process? Okay, does this resetting really help you know search process? Okay, so this was our original motivation. So let me just uh, tell you a little bit about that. So first, let me talk about you know just a search by pure diffusion when there is no resetting. Okay, so imagine that again, you know you have a target at the origin. So this red one here. And you have a Brownian motion, which is starting at x0, which is like a searcher. And this guy is just doing diffusing. And the question is that when is the first time it's going to find the target? Okay. So this is the first passage problem, starting at x0 of a Brownian motion. Very well-known problem. So to solve this, what you do is uh, you first define the survival probability. So you say q0. So in subscript 0 means without resetting. Okay. So this is just a plain, simple Brownian motion. So q of x0t is the probability that the particle starting at the initial position x0 does not meet the target up to time t. So, or in other words, the target survives up to time t. Okay? So if you know the survival probability, then the first passage probability is just the time derivative, minus of the time derivative of the survival probability. Okay? 
So how do you calculate the survival probability? It's very easy. Again, you can write down a backward Fokker-Planck equation, which is just a diffusion equation. That means here, by backward, I mean the you know starting point. X, you don't care about what the final position is. You are starting at x naught, and you say, okay, if I vary x naught, how this q of x naught t is going to change? So you can just you know just change the time by a little bit, and then you know evolve this equation, and you can write down a backward Fokker-Planck equation. Notice that the time derivative here is with respect to x zero. Okay, so final position doesn't matter; they are integrated over. So then you know you can just so and you have to solve it for x naught positive and you have to put an absorbing boundary condition that if the particles if the searcher starts right at the target of course it immediately finds the target so the survival probability is zero okay so you have an absorbing boundary condition at x naught equal to zero and you have to solve this guy in the semi infinite uh, line x naught positive and this is very you know simple this is a classical problem you can find it in the standard book like Redner's book and things like that and the solution is actually given by just error function of x naught by square root of 4 dt okay error function is just the integral of gaussian so first passage probability therefore is just the minus of time derivative of survival probability because you know first passage is just you know if you integrate the first passage from t to infinity that's just the survival probability because or in other words another way of saying is that the you know if you survive up to time t and if you survive up to time t plus dt then you subtract the two and that gives you the flux towards the target at between time t and t plus dt. So that's the first passage probability. So if you just take this result and take a derivative with respect to time, you find the classical result, which is x naught over square root of t cube times c to the power minus x naught square root of 4 dt. This is an exact result for all time t. And in particular, for large time, it decays as a power law as t to the power minus 3 by 2. This is a classic you know, result, which was first derived by Polya and then Chandrasekhar and other people. And what it tells you is that the mean captured time, so this is the first passage probability, and it has a power law tail with an exponent 3 by 2, which means that it is normalizable, but its first moment, which is the mean first passage time, is actually infinite. Okay, And uh, and this is this you know the classical dichotomy of the one-dimensional Brownian motion, because you know, the probability distribution, first passage probability density is perfectly well defined, it's a normalizable distribution, but you know its first moment the mean or a higher moment they don't exist okay so because it has a power law which is one over t to the power three by two so if you multiply it by t it's one over square root of t which is not integrable it is infinite okay. so which means that you know that even though the it'll you know with you know and the first passage probability goes to zero as t goes to infinity which means that the particle will definitely come back to the origin with probability one but the time mean time to come back is actually infinite so this is the sort of uh, you know classical Brownian motion result, uh, and uh, then you can ask, uh, and you can ask, you know, why does it diverge? And uh, physically, and this can be traced back to the fact that you know there are trajectories, typical trajectories, uh, which start from x naught, and they go in the opposite direction. They wander away to plus infinity, uh, in the opposite direction of the target, and such you know wandering trajectories contribute to the mean and makes it infinite essentially. So now when you switch on resetting, what resetting does is to cut off those wandering trajectories and make the mean first passage time finite. Okay. So, so that is what we're going to check now. So now I want I, I switch on this resetting again. So resetting, remember, is rate with rate r. Okay. And to solve this first passage problem or survival problem with resetting, again, we are going to use the renewal approach. Okay. So, so we look at, we spot the time tau, we measure the time tau since the last resetting, okay? So during zero of tau, zero and tau, it's a free diffusion. So I divide the trajectory into two parts. So, so this is the survival probability starting at x naught up to time t in the presence of resetting. The subscript r here is in the presence of resetting. So as usual, it has two terms. First, Think of that when the possibility that there is no resetting. If there is no resetting, which happens with probability to the power minus RT, then you just have the survival probability without the resetting, which we just computed. This is the error function of x naught over square root of 4dt. So this part is clear. Now, if you have more than you know one or more resettings, okay. So in that case, again, it's you know it's useful to look at this time since the last resetting tau, because then you see from from here till the time t, this is the interval tau. Here is a free propagation, so you have to have you have to survive the target during this uh, time. 
So which means this is the survival probability without resetting, Q0 of x0 tau. But you have to also ensure that from 0 to t minus tau, you had survived. And this is in the presence of resetting, because I'm not considering you know, the details of here. So here to here, it survived with resetting rate r. So therefore, this is qr of x0 t minus tau. And the probability that the last resetting occur between time tau and tau t plus d tau, tau plus d tau, is just r e to the power minus r tau d tau. Okay? And it's a Markov process, so it's just a product of these two. Okay? So this is an exact sort of uh, you know, self-consistent equation, like a Swinger Dyson e equation, if you like. And again, you can trivially solve it by taking, you know, because this side is a convolution form, so you can take a Laplace transform on both sides, and then this becomes the product of this. And from that, you can actually solve, but I'll not show you the details. And once you have this, you know, this solution, then you just, you know, take again the minus time derivative and calculate the mean first passage time. And what you find is that this time, that this is, first of all, finite, and it's given by a very simple formula, 1 over r e to the power square root of r over dx naught minus 1. Okay. So therefore, the mean capture time is infinite when r equal to 0. You see, this guy diverges as r goes to 0. So it's infinite when r is equal to 0, but finite when r is bigger than 0. Okay. So, so this is the first you know, observation that uh, the resetting does uh, render the mean first passage time finite as opposed to infinite when without resetting. And uh, moreover, if you plot this mean first passage time as a function of uh, the resetting rate r for fixed x0 and d, so what you find is that when r goes to 0, it diverges. Okay? And this is because, of, because Brownian motion is divergent. But on the other hand, when r goes to infinity, it again diverges as exponential of square root of r. So it diverges on both sides. And these two physical reasons are very clear because in the limit r goes to zero, you see, as I said, you know, there are the trajectories which take it away, you know, to plus infinity opposite to the target. And so therefore, you know, they, they contribute to the mean, making the mean infinite. So this is this end here. On the other hand, if you, you know, if you reset it too often, okay, you know, you're resetting all the time, then essentially this trajectory is totally localized around x naught. It doesn't, then again, it misses the target, right? It cannot move away this side. It's totally localized around there. And again, the mean first passage time becomes infinite, okay? So it diverges at the two ends, and typically it has a minimum, of course, it, typically it has a single minimum. And this single unique minimum, which is you can just compute it just by taking derivative of that, where the mean first passage time actually becomes minimal. That means there is an optimal resetting rate which makes the first passage time minimal. Okay? So not only finite, but also minimal. Okay? And this is, you can just easily compute it, just take, taking derivative and set it to be zero. And you find that this min minimal, you know, optimal uh, resetting rate R star is given by gamma squared D over X naught squared, where this gamma is just a root of a transcendental equation, I mean, uh, some number basically. Okay? So, so therefore, you know, the conclusion is that there, there's, a, there's an optimal resetting rate so actually, so this this empirical observation that resetting actually does better, this is just a you know this, in this model you see a proof of that indeed that resetting not only does better, there is even you can choose the resetting rate to have a particular value, which actually helps you to find to find the target much faster. Okay, so this was our main conclusion, and then you know this. Uh, Shotoda, there is yes. a question here. Would you like to take it now or later? Uh, Okay, I mean, uh, as you wish, I mean, because since the time is running out, let me just finish it. I can take call the questions at the end. Is it okay? Okay, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So then, you know, to target search, you can, I mean, this was in D equal to one, but then you can actually generalize it to higher D also. Okay, so uh, D bigger than one, for instance, I mean, uh, same problem. So D bigger than one, of course, I mean, if your D is bigger than two, then you have to, you know, put a finite size to the target because if it's a point target, the Brownian motion will always miss the point target. So you have to put a finite size cutoff. Uh, and you can say that your target, your Brownian motion starts at R0 and it just diffuses and once in a while it resets. And then you want to, you know, whenever it touches this ball of radius little a, and then you, you find the target. And again, you can compute the, uh, you know, survival probability by using this renewal property. I'll not go into the details. And you can actually calculate the mean first passage time explicitly in terms of these some basal functions and so on. But the point is that, again, for fixed R0, if you plot it as a function of little r, what you find is that there's an optimal R star that minimizes this uh, mean first passage time and in all dimensions. Okay, so of course, R star depends on D, but uh, the fact that there's an R star 
this is true in all dimensions. All right. So this was, you know, the you know few years back. This was the, these were the results. Uh, and so the main to summarize. So basically, this uh, you know main paradigm is that there is an optimal resetting rate in many of these stochastic resetting problems, and this is very robust. Uh, and it exists in all dimensions for diffusion, and you know it has been studied in a variety of other processes. I don't go into the details, uh, and uh, but there are some problems where you know the R star can be zero actually, so optimal or R star can be infinite, not finite value, and the condition that you know there is an optimal R star was worked out by uh, Arno and uh, Slomi Ruveni, uh, so it's a very nice paper here, and. Uh, and then you know it has been applied in many 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 different problems and i'll not go into the i don't have time to go through all the details it's a very long list many many people have contributed to that and uh, we wrote it in sort of recent reviews stochastic resetting and applications with martin evans and gregory share in 2020 but it's already a bit updated and outdated because you know there have been many many works after that so it's not completely exhaustive uh, review and uh, so now let me come to the experiments. Uh, so, so, so far I've been talking about just a simple model and theory, and theory is rapidly developing, as I said. Uh, so what about experiments? So there are two recent experiments, uh, one from the group of Tal Friedman from, uh, from Tel Aviv University, and uh, just after that it was from, uh, from the uh, group of Siliberto in uh, UNS Leo, and I was involved in the second experiment, so I'll just... Uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the more or less both of them use optical tools as so the actual details of the setups are slightly slightly different okay so in this experiment uh, with Silibarto, so the idea is the following so i mean main question was that you know how do you actually you know reset in experiment in the, in the model it's very clean right so it's a very very simple you just you know put the particle back to x naught but in reality how do you put the particle back to x naught you cannot just you know hold the air of the particle and push it uh, to the these things is it's not always feasible and so so the question was how, what is the how do you devise a experimental protocol for resetting and uh, and th that's how you know this, this thing was interesting uh, and uh, so it turns out that okay so the protocol is the following so you just you know first you make the free diffusion just as in the model for a certain period which can be deterministic or random random for example it's just exponential distributed uh, and then you switch on the optical trap. So the particle is in this, uh, you know, uh, in your trap. So you switch on the trap, and you, when you switch on the trap, the, the trap is trying, you know, will try to make the particle equilibrate through its thermal distribution, which is typically a Gaussian distribution if you have a harmonic trap, and uh, and this is the resetting. Okay, and and then again you switch, and once you, when you are, you know, when you are relaxing the particle towards its thermal equilibrium. So it won't be exactly a delta function x naught, but you'll have a Gaussian width around the x naught. Okay, so that's a thermal distribution. And once it has achieved this equilibrium distribution, and then you again, you know, so that's like the resetting basically. And during that period, you do not make any measurement. And then again, you you know switch on, switch off the trap and make it free diffusion, you know, again for a random period of time. And again, you switch on the trap and you alternate. Okay. And uh, and as I said. The trouble with, I mean, and not trouble, I mean, this nice thing was with this experiment is that, you know, in theory, we always reset it to x naught equal to zero or whatever, some point position, which is a delta function distribution. But in, but, you know, if you do this, uh, you know, relaxation in the thermal trap, uh, optical trap, then it relaxes to thermal distribution, which is, you know, for a harmonic trap, it's always Gaussian with the width sigma, and the sigma is typically temperature, the square root of temperature by spring constant cup. And uh, so the point is that the, uh, this finite width, we can ask then, you know, what happens to this resetting problem in the presence of a finite width of the, you know, of the resetting position, basically. And this turns out to have a very interesting effects on the mean first passage times. And this was the point of the experiment, because the experiment was not just to mimic the theory, because you can ask, you know, why do, they, why do you do the experiment if you just to, you know, you can do simulations. Main point was the experiment, at least this, this experiment was that, you know, that uh, we came to know about this finite effect, you know, the effect of a finite sigma. And that was actually very, very interesting effects. And I'll not go into the details, but I'll just tell you what happens. Uh, so remember that in theory, when, when I was showing you the results before, that corresponds to, you know, resetting to the delta function distribution that the sigma is actually zero. So now what happens when, it, when your delta is non-zero? Sorry, sigma is non-zero. Okay. So what happens is very interesting. So what I'm plotting here is the mean first passage time as a function 
of this uh, parameter, you know, C, C is like resetting rate R, B, if you like, okay. So R, so you are plotting as a function of R for different values of L over sigma, okay. L is the distance to the target from, and, and sigma is the width of the resetting distribution. So remember that when sigma equal to zero, that is when B is infinite, then what you have is you have a curve that we have seen that, you know, it has a minimum and it, it is, it diverges at the both ends, okay. So this is b equal to infinity. So now you make sigma finite. That means b is less than infinite. B is finite. When b is finite, so what happens when b is still high? That you know it has this minimum. Then it increases again, achieves a maximum, and then it goes down and goes to zero as resetting rate goes to infinity. This is for some large value of b. And then, so this means that this is a metastable minimum. Real minimum actually happens at c, c at r equal to infinity. And then as you decrease B, there is a critical value BC, which you can compute. It turns out to be, you know, 2.53, some you know, exact number, trans, roots of some trans, transcendental equation. And below this critical value BC, this maximum disappears, and you have a, just a monotonically, monotonically decreasing function going to zero at R equal to infinity. That means for B less than BC, the optimal value of resetting is actually infinite. And this is sort of, uh, you know, understandable because what happens then is that, you know, you can find the target just by resetting because, you know, your width is very big now. Sigma is very small. I mean, so B, sorry, B is large, which means sigma is very large. B, B is small, sigma is large. So sigma is large, that means you are resetting to a position from a random position and that has a width, which is very large. So, but just by resetting by chance, you might find the target if it is within, if sigma is within the target length. So you don't have to do additional diffusion. You know, just by resetting, continuous resetting, you can actually find the target. And this is a very generic. So this, this is a spinoidal phase transition, dynamical phase transition, if you like, at B equal to BC, which we could not have guessed from the theory unless the experiment was done. Okay. So, so and then it turns out that this, uh, some, you know, similar spinoidal transition also occurs in other problems, like in active particles with resetting and so on. There's some recent work with uh, the group of Dambasi. And, uh, and also, you know, this experiment, we could do it in 1D, 2D, and 3D. So 1D was this paper here, and 2D and 3D is the later paper by some same group of Silvato. All right. So this is the experiment. I'll take all the questions because, I mean, I like to, you know, when I'm answering to questions, I like to see the face of the person. Somehow I, I cannot see it here. So let me take the, all the questions at the end. Okay. So now let me generalize to sort of, uh, so, so far I've been talking about a single particle system, but you know, resetting is very general. You can ask for many body system, what happens when you reset a many body system? So, so, so the general, okay, the general feature of stochastic resetting in a nutshell is the following. So you have any stochastic process, X of T, and uh, so it is evolving by its own dynamics, which could be deterministic or it could be stochastic, and it evolves during a certain random amount of time, okay? So in this picture, you see a time, it evolved up to time T1. And at the end of this random period, the process is reset to its initial position, okay, or some randomly chosen position. And then again, you know, it continues with its free dynamics, natural dynamics, up to another random interval of time. And then again, reset, and again, evolves, again, reset, and so on. Okay, so it alternates. So, and, and, you, and what we assume in order that, the, you know, this, all this renewal argument works, is that the the this you know successive interval distributions are statistically independent uh, p of tau, and for Poissonian resetting with a constant rate r, which is the simplest case, I mean p of tau is just exponential distribution. But if you have a deterministic evolution, periodic resetting, then you have just equal period t t t etc. Capital t capital t capital t etc. Okay, so you can you know you can choose your I mean you can, this problem has a lot of flexibility. You can choose whatever you want. You know I mean. You can uh, choose uh, the resetting distributions. You can as from power laws or whatever you want, and uh, but the basic idea is very simple. I mean, you have a natural dynamics, and you just stop it and restart. That's it. Okay. So in that sense, you can easily generalize to many body system. So so for example, you take any many body system with interaction. So for instance, Ising model or fluctuating interfaces, evolving under its own you know own natural stochastic dynamics, and then you you know subject it to reset. To its initial configuration at a constant rate r. Okay. So as I said, examples are fluctuating interfaces, uh, or uh, like KPZ equation, or uh, the Kardar Parizh Chang equation, or uh, Edwards Wilkinson's equation, or Ising model with global dynamics, etc. Okay. So for instance, here, so a configuration of the system is specified in the case of fluctuating interfaces 
by the heights. Heights are different space points. So this is the H1, H2, H3. These are heights. So these are your degrees of freedom. So you have a many body system now. So this could be the heights of, as I said, KPZ or Edwards Wilkinson's interface. Or it could be just the spins of an Ising model with the L sites, S1, S2, S3, SL. Okay. And uh, so what you do is that, again, you know, let's say P or C of T, probability that the system is in configuration C at time T in the presence of resetting R. And when you reset, you reset back to the starting configuration. Okay. So instead of a position, you have a, just a configuration now. So again, you can write down the same you know, renewal equation. So PR, C of T. So this is the probability that there is no resetting. In that case, this is just this guy here. And then if you have you know, one or more resettings, again, you look for the time since the last resetting, this tau. And during that time, you just have a free evolution. Therefore, this is P0 of C of tau. So if you know P0 of C of tau, that without resetting, the probability uh, for the system to be in configuration C at time tau, you can actually compute the PRC of T. Okay? And this we had used uh, with Shamik and uh, Gregory uh, for quite a lot for, for, uh, for uh, heights of Edward Wilkinson's interface. And what you see is that at the long time limit, it again approaches a non-equilibrium stationary state, which is this term drops out and you just have an integral zero to infinity d tau. So, so this is just exponential times the you know unreset uh, distribution, non-reset distribution of the configuration. Okay? And so then you can actually, you know, de device, if you like, a new sort of ensemble, which you call the resetting ensemble. That means you just take, you know, your, or, you know, you, so this, this has the following interpretation. So, so this is, this ensemble is defined in the following way. So this is the PRC of the probability that the system is in configuration C at time, you know, at time goes to infinity in the presence of resetting. But when you write it in this form, you can interpret in this way. So you take your, you know, unreset system of different copies without resetting okay you draw infinitely many copies you evolve each of them by a random time tau okay evolve each of them by separately each copy you evolve it by a random tau drawn exponent from your exponential distribution and then you just you know average over all possible evolution of time okay so any observable if you want to calculate in this ensemble this is just observable which you calculate without resetting and then you just have to, you know, and evolve it by a random time tau. And then you just take the exponent and average with the weight, exponential weight. And that will give you the, you know, the, um, the uh, expectation value of this observable in this stationary state. And this is, you know, this is the, uh, this is the example we have used repeatedly. And you can use the same example for quantum resetting problems. That is the work we did with uh, Krishnan Dushan Gupta and Bhaskar Mukherjee. I'll come back to that later if I have time. And uh, so for example, I just want to show you uh, just one example of Ising model in 2D, where you have a new non-equilibrium steady state with an interesting phase diagram in the TR plane. So imagine that you have an Ising model, which is you, you are evolving by the non-concept global dynamics, starting from a random initial configuration. And, uh, and then with rate R, you are resetting back to the starting random configuration. And then you ask simplest, simplest questions to ask, what happens to the magnetization distribution? So, so let me just show you the phase diagram. So what I have, the phase diagram is in the R T plane. So R is the vertical axis and T is the horizontal axis. So first let me explain what happens at R equal to zero. Just remind you when R is zero, that means, you know, we are without resetting normalizing model with global dynamics. Okay. Starting from random initial configuration. And you ask, okay, I let the evolve, uh, let the system evolve in time by non conserved global dynamics. And I monitor the uh, the magnetization distribution and let's please say that i start from an initial configuration where the spins are random but you know each spin is positive with probability you know uh, m0 i mean with a certain magnetization with probability p and one minus p is down so therefore 2p minus one is the initial magnetization okay, which i called m0 so you start from initial magnetization m0 but otherwise there is absolutely random initial configuration evolved by global dynamics and then you monitor the distribution of the magnetization that is you know average spin per uh, per site uh, and uh, what is the you ask what is the distribution of the magnetization in the long time limit so what happens that if you are above tc that means if you are in the paramagnetic side don't look at this curve now if you are in the paramagnetic side you will actually you know get a delta function distribution because the magnetization will be zero in the eventually so eventual magnetization distribution will be delta function at zero if you are on the ferromagnetic side t is less than tc then there is an ordering 
and you, you have two delta function peaks one at m equilibrium delta function at a plus m equilibrium and delta function at minus m equilibrium but if you start from initially m0 positive you will always have a delta function at m equilibrium basically okay so you just have a very boring two delta functions okay and now you switch on the resetting and you ask what happens to these two delta functions on the uh, paramagnetic and ferromagnetic side so what happens is the following so you have okay you have one line here which is the vertical line which is exactly at tc and then there's another line crossover line here this is shown by the dotted line and there are three phases if you like here so first let's look at this so here we call it a paramagnetic phase the one so here what happens is that if you monitor the distribution of the magnetization in the stationary state in the long time limit what you find is that the delta function at m you know at m equal to zero now gets spread out as a sort of uh, non-trivial distribution which decays uh, and uh, so the gap there is no gap here between zero and the magnetization and the typical value of the magnetization is actually zero because this curve has distribution as a maximum at m equal to zero so the so the even though there is a non probability of non-zero magnetization but typically you will find that the magnetization is still zero although it's not a strict delta function it has a width now all right now in this side when t is less than tc and r is positive what you find is this is the analog of the ferromagnetic phase and here what you find is that there's a gap opens up when r equal to zero remember there was a delta function at m equilibrium okay now that delta function spreads out and it becomes a broad distribution here it you know it's almost in a this is essential so it's essentially zero so this is gapless basically sorry gapful and then you have a broad spectrum here and there's a you know it ends at m0 and uh, so you have a you know you have a non-zero gap and in the typical value of the magnetization which is the maximum of this curve it happens at a non-zero value so this is a typical signature of ferromagnetic phase there but then there's a new phase here which is a sort of a new phase which is which you call pseudo ferro phase so here what happens is the typical magnetization maximum occurs at m0 so at a non-zero value but there is no gap in the spectrum there is no gap in the magnetization distribution so partly it's like a ferro because the, there's a non-zero magnet typical magnetization but partly it's like para because you know there is no there's no gap it's a gapless phase okay so this is the sort of you know the resetting introduces a new uh, phase in the eyes even in the plain simple 2d ising model okay and there are many other questions here uh, which have not been studied these are open problems i mean like you know for example study of course systematic study of correlation functions and so on but basically the point i'm trying to say is that you can ask resetting about any any uh, arbitrary many body system okay so let me just first now summarize and to conclude uh, so what i gave you is a brief and partial overview of stochastic resetting and as I said, it's a very active and uh, rapidly evolving field of research. I could not cover everything. I apologize for that. So the main thing, you know, for us, it was that, you know, first conclude, first thing was that, you know, it actually is a very simple mechanism to find a sort of new non-equilibrium stationary state. Uh, that's the number one. And number two, it has a sort of unusual temporal relaxation to the stationary state, which has a you know, second order dynamical phase transition for the diffusion with resetting problem. And then search of a stationary target for a diffusion and resetting actually is very efficient. Uh, typically, it has an optimal resetting rate R star, which minimizes the mean first passage time okay, in all dimensions. Uh, and the experiments actually have raised new interesting questions uh, like the spin and new phenomena like the spinodal phase transition. Uh, which was, uh, you know, which was not expected from, I mean, which was not studied in the theory. And uh, there are many new recent directions, I mean, uh, where the field is propagating quite fast. So, for example, you can ask about the geometrical properties of territory covered by resetting Brownian motion. For example, you can ask, you know, when if you look at the resetting Brownian motion, let's say in two, one dimension or two dimension, you have a span or you have a, you know, territory, if you think of the animal, so what is the typical territory it covers? So you can actually draw a convex hull around it or the number of distinct sites visited by the animal and so on. And you can ask their statistics and there's a lot of work on that. Then you have the, you know, so far I was talking about a completely uh, resetting without memory. And, uh, but you can ask for resetting with memory. So which means that somehow it remembers which sites it has visited in the past, for example, in the diffusion, okay. And there are again, you know, quite a lot of work on that. And there's still a lot of, you know, interesting first passage problems with memory, which uh, currently people are working on. 
And then uh, you can ask for resetting Brownian motion with several constraints. For example, you can ask for Brown re resetting Brownian bridges and their optimal properties and quite a few interesting results you can derive there. And, uh, and then there's this first passage resetting. That means, you know, you reset only when you, you know, you cross a certain threshold for the first time. And this was some interesting work done by the Bruin, Rand and Farling, both were my students and with Sid Redner in collaboration with Sid Redner. And, um, and also, you know, recently it has been applied to stochastic optimal control theory. So this is a branched out from physics now into computer science, if you like. Uh, so there was a very nice paper by the Bruin and Moore recently. Then in queuing theory, so Arno with Kosinski and Ruveni, they actually applied the resetting in queuing theory. This is also a very interesting piece of work. Uh, and then resetting in many body classical systems, as I already mentioned, uh, but there have been other works, for example, for, you know, symmetric exclusion process uh, with uh, Una and uh, Onupam and uh, Ornob. And uh, then uh, recently, very recently, about more than one Brownian particles. Uh, so there's a Grapivsky, Wilk, Mission, and then also uh, Biroli, Laralde, myself, and Gregory Scherer. So there are many, many interesting phenomena. I could not talk about all this here. Then resetting in quantum many body systems, as I said, that this quantum problems with resetting was actually started with a joint work with uh, with uh, uh, Krishandu and his student Bhaskar Mukherjee uh, here in uh, ISS, and uh, and then for it, it was followed up by many other recent works, and it's really going to quantum computation where the resetting seems to be playing an important, increasingly important role, and and many other directions. Of course, I'll not have time to talk about that. And uh, so main you know, take home message is that the stochastic resetting is a very rich and interesting static and dynamical phenomena. And you know, it's, it's rapidly evolving. And you know, as you see, I mean, you can ask many, you know, whatever questions you want. I mean, uh, you can ask many questions and study it in a very simple setting. And for me, that's the most interesting thing. And uh, so in fact, I mean, there was a uh, very recently, last year, there was a, um, a special issue in JFIZ uh, which was uh, edited by Onupam Kundu and uh, Stromi Rubeni on stochastic resetting. Uh, and this was to celebrate the 10 years of this uh, original paper. And there are many, many interesting articles in this special issue in case you are interested. And lastly, let me uh, acknowledge all my collaborators. So Marco Biroli, Benjamin Di Bruin, Constantino Di Bello, Matthew Magoni, they were master and PhD students at Orsay. And Francisco Mori, who just finished his PhD and uh, gone off to Oxford for his postdoc. Uh, and there are many, many, many collaborators with whom I have collaborated here, some people from Calcutta. And uh, so I thank all of them. And it was a really great pleasure to collaborate. And, uh, and okay, here are some references, but that's not very important. So, okay, all right. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir, uh, Satya, for this very nice presentation. Now, uh, there are a few questions during your talk, which were uh, yes. typed in the chat box. Okay, so, so I suggest Anish, uh, you can, uh, do you want, can you switch on your camera and ask yourself or do you want me to read it? Yeah, yeah I can ask. Yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, in the second term of the renewal equation, uh, yes. can the number of resetting times be interpreted? Like uh, there were no implication about how many times resetting is happening? Yeah, this is yeah, this is a good, this is a very good question actually. So actually, you know, no, I mean, I mean, you don't. I mean, to calculate the first passage time or the mean first passage time, I mean, or or even the position distribution, you do not need to know the number of resettings. Okay, but you can ask yourself that what is the number of resettings till you know you to find the target, and this is actually very easy to compute. You can show that this has a kind of Poisson distribution. Yeah. With a certain mean, basically. So this, this is not. In fact, I mean, in, in a recent paper with Martin Evans and Gregory Sher, uh, in the context of a predator prey model, this was in this um, review article. I, this was in this uh, special issue uh, in JFIS I mentioned. So there we actually computed the statistics of the number of resettings, but in a particular setting, essentially. Okay. So it includes any times of resetting at them. Like it can be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, you can, you can ask, you know, what is because the number of resetting still you find the target, right? Or up yeah. to fixed time t, that right. is also a random variable, and you can ask its statistics. And I'm telling you that this this will be just a simple Poisson distribution. This okay, and uh, I have another two questions. So. Sure. My, isn't it intuitive that uh, resetting at the same places makes it easier to find around that desired place? 
So what's so non-intuitive? No, no. I mean, you see, the, the point is that, you know, I mean, okay. So you can actually reset to any position you like. Okay. You don't yeah. have to reset always to this initial position. Okay. Yeah. But the point is, I mean, and, and this is something, you know, some people often ask me this question, but the, the point is, you know, when you reset to the initial position, okay. So that is like a Green's function, you know, I mean, when you solve, for example, diffusion equation, okay. I mean, how do you solve it? You know, often, you know, in any partial differential equation, I mean, if you have a source function, okay. So let's say, suppose I want to solve this following partial differential equation that del P del T minus del square P equal to some F of X. Okay. Right. So how do you solve this? So you first, you know, replace the F of X by delta of X minus X naught right. and then delta of T minus T naught, right? So this, and then you, this, this will give you the Green's function. And when you know the Green's function, then if you, you know, just multiply by the source function FX and integrate, that gives you the solution, right? Yeah. So, in the resetting problem, what you can show, and, and this was discussed in the original paper, that you know this resetting to the starting point is like a Green's function. If you know this answer, you can actually calculate the resetting to any arbitrary point just by integrating over the final position, basically, the resetting position. So I'm saying that you reset at the same places, so probability of finding it there will be higher at long times, right? It's a yes, of course, yeah, yeah, certainly. That's why you have the, the position distribution as a peak at the resetting position, right? Clearly. But we get some non-trivial like phase transition or not phase transition, not phase transition. It's just you know the probability density to be at the resetting position is the is is bigger than the other positions, right? That's quite quite normal because you are resetting it there, so you are giving more probability flux to that point basically. So getting the stationary state at at higher times is uh, intuitive. So we should get. Yes, you should get definitely yes. But you know, I mean, it's not. It's not that not that always you get a stationary state. It depends on the details of the problem. I mean, with the exponential resetting, you get. But if you have a power yeah, yeah. law, if you have yeah. a power law resetting, you may not get. You know, it depends on the power basically. You may not get the stationary state always. Right. And uh, and one last question that this resetting thing. Yeah. So can it be uh, interpreted as some microscopic interaction or physical phenomena happening in a system? To some dy dynamical properties happening in the system. Well, I mean, you know, there, there, you know, I mean, many, I mean, I, I mean, like I didn't have to talk about in many chemical reactions, for example, I mean, this Michaelis maintained problem, you know, you can interpret the rates of uh, the chemical reactions as effective resetting rate. Okay, so this was actually worked out by uh, Ruveni and co collaborators, uh, and uh, so many, many problems you can actually, you know, my any microscopic move you can interpret in terms of resetting. Okay. Okay. So, so they are exactly can be yeah they, they are exactly uh, you know you can just interpret this as resetting basically so this is uh, how in dna this uh, resetting thing is interpreted in dna no dna is the same thing. i mean dna i mean dna typically you know typical search process if you look at the you know how the protein you know searches for a site to bind on a dna it undergoes a 3d diffusion and then it you know binds and then undergoes a 1d diffusion and so on and so again i mean if you if you just you know just to go back and restart, I mean, then it might find the position much more faster, basically. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Sure. Yeah. Premashish, do you want to unmute yourself and ask question? Okay. He doesn't have a webcam, so maybe I could read it out for yes, him. Please. Uh, Premashish is asking, for a system functioning under a fixed energy budget or resource poor environment, is it useful or sufficient to quantify the optimality of the search process only from the dynamical viewpoint without incorporating the energetic cost of the resetting? No, that's a good question. In fact, I mean, uh, absolutely, this is this is the right question to ask. And people have, have been actually working on a particular cost function. You know, you can associate, I mean, here, of course, I mean, this is a very simple measure of cost function, which is the mean first passage time. But you can say that, Okay, here I'm doing resetting without any cost, but actually, I mean, like you, even when you are doing experiment, I mean, when you are, you know, switching on the optical trap, I mean, this requires work done, right? So, so therefore, there is a cost of resetting, and uh, so this has been studied in some models, but not very systematically. In fact, I mean, the one paper I mentioned, which is this stochastic optimal control theory paper by Francisco Mori and Benjamin De Bruin, so they have actually incorporated a particular special type of cost function for resetting and so on. And there are increasingly more work about that actually. So, so yeah, this is this is a good question, but this is 
you know, you have to work it out. Yes. No, no, it's, it's certainly not. This is the simplest thing where your cost function is just, uh, I mean, effectively is like the mean first passage time. That's what you are optimizing. But uh, in principle, you should, you should add to it, you know, the cost for resetting. Any other question from the online participants or anybody from the Silver Jubilee Hall? Please raise your hand. Uh, yeah, can I ask a question? Anivesh, please go ahead. Uh, hi. So, in your example, mm -hmm. uh, you have Sorry. reset. First example, you have reset to a single point. Right. Now, uh, and the uh, uh, dynamical phase transition in the large deviation function seems to have come from the dynamics of this uh, process, like trajectories which have reset and which have not been reset or something like that. Sure, sure. Now, if your reset point is time dependent, mm -hmm. and there will still be these two different kinds of dynamics, still the trajectories which have been reset and not reset. Yeah, it depends on the, it depends on the you know, dynamics of your uh, reset, I mean, how you are doing. I mean, it depends on that. I mean, so so the, the existence of the dynamical phase transition is not obvious. No, the existence trivial. of the dynamical phase transition is, is just for this particular example. I mean, it is it's for diffusion. Basically. <laughs> That's the simplest model. So you can ask for a given problem whether, but that, but this kind of you know singularities in 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 uh, in a rate function, large deviation function is very common now. You know, in many many problems out of equilibrium, this happens. Okay, and uh, and there are you know these singularities typically signify some kind of phase transitions in the system. Okay, so the phase transition here is as you mentioned. I mean, you know, the basically between two types of trajectories. Uh, so there is one phase where uh, basically you have these uh, trajectories which have undergone many resets and therefore they have essentially reached the stationary state. Whereas outside, outside the light cone, there are these trajectories which have undergone very few, one or two resettings, and they're essentially still diffusing. It. Okay. So, so what resetting, I mean, what this dynamics does at a finite time t, this light cone does, it separates the, if you like, the trajectories uh, which have undergone many resets and than the ones which have not undergone any resets. So these are the two phases, and there's a transition between them, and that's that's the sort of singularity in the rate function. So rate function in the singularity typically, you know, signifies that there's there's some underlying two phases, and there's something is going on between right. them basically. And this is actually very common. I mean, in many many different problems in you know non-equilibrium you know, stat make. I mean, non-equilibrium equilibrium stat make also because equilibrium stat make like Ising model. You know the free energy is exactly the you know the if you write the partition function you can write the partition function as the to the power you know volume times some function of you know your uh, the energy by uh, volume and this function is a large division function and you know that you know the uh, this function phi at you know i mean this is a micro canonical uh, ising model basically so at, at a critical value of the energy ec it will have a singularity so, uh, so that also, you know, basically undergoes, it signifies the phase transition between the ferromagnetic and paramagnetic phase. Okay. Thank you. Animesh, you had raised your hand. Do you want to ask? Okay. A okay. I have a question. Yes. Okay. How did this uh, resetting volume affect the entry products are read in the system? So, is it related to yeah, the last is, no, okay. So there, there have been some recent studies of the entropy production in resetting problems. I mean, again, there's a recent paper by Shupriya Krishnamurti's group, uh, Francisco Mori and Supriya Krishnamurti. So they have studied the uh, the entropy production in resetting processes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Can I ask one question? Yeah. Ramesh, Ramesh. Oh. Yeah, uh, so can you mention the paper where you said that there are discussions about the Green's function uh, appearance from resetting? I think it is one of uh, one of my early papers from 2011. I don't remember it exactly, but okay. I think it was a JFZ article with uh, Martin Evans. It was not the PRL one, but the okay. second one basically. I think it's called optimal optimal resetting or something. Diffusion with optimal resetting. Okay, thanks. Okay, Ramesh, you wanted to ask a question? Yes. Hello? Yeah. Uh, you have find a minimum at r equal to r star for the first passage time. Yes. But in the experiment, I have noticed there is also a maximum. Uh, yes. What is, why there is a maximum there? Well, this I explained already. I mean, so basically what happens is that when you have finite sigma, right? So imagine the following. I mean, what is the experiment doing? So you have a fixed target somewhere, okay? And, and then you have this diffusing particle 
and the once in a while you put on the trap so that means you are forcing the particle to uh, going towards the origin but the target is at some position l okay so i mean if you are if you are able to reset if sigma is very small that means width of the trap is very small then you will be more more or less localized around the around the origin right so target will still be very far away okay but and this is the case the, in the theory basically okay but if your you know trap width is bigger that means when you are resetting and thermalizing the system the equilibrium distribution of the position of the particle which is the resetting distribution you know it, it has a gaussian shape now okay with a finite width now if the you know if the target which is at a distance l so if l is already within this gaussian width then it can just find the uh, target just by resetting right so that's why you know what happens is that you know i mean r equal to infinity is also another minimum point because r equal to infinity mean first place because just if you make in that case if you just make you know multiple you know immediately many many resettings you'll just find you don't have to do extra diffusion you just have to just by because every time you are resetting you are just you know updating the distribution of the particle right and if if it is if the target is within this distribution it will just find just by resetting it doesn't have to do the uh, you know diffusion and that is why r star equal to infinity is another minimum so there are two minimums coexisting if you like one is a, at a finite value and one at r star equal to infinity and these two minimum they compete with each other and at some point you know the one minimum disappears and this is a first order spin order transition basically so then r equal to infinity is the only minimum okay, okay. rupayan please go ahead Uh, okay, so my question was: uh, when you define, when you draw the time to reset, you uh, usually take the Poisonian distribution. Yes. So if if we change the distribution, then uh, it it should affect, right? So yeah, yeah, of course it does. It should affect, and this has been studied also. I mean, for example, you can ask, you know, if I take a power law distribution, what happens? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this was actually studied by in a paper by Shamik Gupta and uh, and uh, I think it was. Uh, Somebody else, one of his collaborators. I think Apurbo, Apurbo, um, Apurbo what? Apurbo what? Shakuntala. No, Apurbo Nagar, I think. Apurbo Nagar, yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yes. So Shamik and Apurbo, they were they studied this problem basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, people have studied with uh, non poisoning and resetting also. Okay, so then the parameter is not R, so some other parameter. If we are considering power laws, then. No, no, minus actually, no. I mean, you will have some uh, some parameter of the distribution. See, basically, what you have to you know carry out is is that the mean essentially what is R? R is just the mean time between the intervals. Okay. Yes. So whatever you do, I mean, if you that is your control parameter, if you like. Okay. So the mean okay. time R is just one over the mean time between between successive in, uh, resetting. So you can choose from any distribution you like, you'd like, and that mean will be your control parameter, uh, your analog of R, basically. Okay, so another uh, thing that I had a confusion. So when when we are uh, searching, the target is uh, at some distance r. So where we start the reset? I mean, let's say it start we reset to x naught, and the target is at x equal to zero. So yes. does it matter that I reset to x naught, or if I integrate it over, then it makes some change? I mean, if I integrate over x naught, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, of course it will change. That's that's exactly what I was saying. That you know, if you have a resetting distribution. Then this was already worked out in my paper with uh, Martin Evans in 2011. That if you, you know, okay. what happens to the mean first pass is time when the resetting position is not delta function but has a distribution, basically. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Rajoshi, please go ahead. Hey, Rajoshi. <laughs> Kick over. Okay, I'm fine. Okay, <laughs> now I have a question, very, maybe a naive question. If you have a moving target. Yes. And you reset. Does it Very help? difficult problem. <laughs> Very no. Okay, here, let me let me give you an open problem. Yeah. Okay? Just take two two diffusing particles. Okay. Yeah. One of them is doing resetting. One of them is just doing normal diffusion. Yes. Yes. And exactly. I'm thinking about it because yeah, you can take problem, a polymer and two yeah, ends of polymer. Exactly. One but end is looking for the other. This problem part. is very hard to solve. At least I could not do it. Maybe you can yeah. do it. I don't know. <laughs> it came to my mind. No, honestly, honestly, I could not do it. I mean, I tried very hard for this problem. But if you can do it, that will be great, actually. I, I somehow had the feeling that it's probably not that difficult, but uh, but I could not do it. No, that that's a very interesting problem, of course. I mean, 
No, this is that, that's why I like this uh, field because it's very simple to state, right? And there are yeah, very yeah. interesting problems here, yeah, 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 yeah. which is very simple but appealing problems. I mean. yes, because I had this uh, polymer looping uh, yes. that problem in my mind. Right, so right. One end of the polymer is looking for the other end. Precisely. It is diffusing, and whether right. one end resets, so that it helps. Right, so, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I see another raised hand from Arup Biswas. Please go ahead. And um, if possible, switch on your uh, camera. Uh, hi. So, uh, at the very first few slides, you showed uh, you are searching for a global minima, and uh, restart can help. Yes. So, in most of the physical scenarios, you do not know where the global minima is. So, how do you define the target there? I mean, how do you start yeah. in a quantitative level? No, no. I mean, it's just this is just to say that you know, imagine that there is a global minimum somewhere. Okay, all this is telling you that instead of, I mean, you can ask, you know, what happens with resetting is good or without resetting is good. Okay, all I'm saying is that with resetting always will help you. Okay, and this was actually empirically observed. And this is just to, I mean, I, I just showed you. I didn't look at the multi-dimensional example, but this was just a, you know, cartoon problem. The diffusion is just one example. But generically, I mean, you will find that if you do, for example, just by simulation, this has not been done by the way, you know, take a random energy landscape, whatever it is, okay? And all I'm telling you is that you, you, you try to search the global minimum, assuming that such a global minimum exists somewhere, you don't know, of course, where it is. Sir. You try without resetting and you try with resetting, okay? And with resetting is always better than without resetting. So, typically. Uh, typically. So, so uh... On a quantitative level, has it been studied that? Uh, no, no, it has not been studied. That's what I'm telling you. This is, this is there are many, many open problems in this field. Okay, this has not been quantitatively studied. So you can take very simple example. For example, just take a Gaussian field with some you know prescribed cor correlation function. Okay, and then you, you can say that I start from some configuration of the height, and I just do simulated handling. That means you know I mean I just move to a new configuration of height by just just by changing the height locally. And uh, and I accept if it is you know energy decreases or something, and then you ask okay you do it with resetting and without resetting okay I mean analytically it will be hard to solve this problem but uh, numerically you can try and uh, I think that will be interesting to show that indeed resetting helps in this case. Okay. Thank you. And even if it doesn't help, then that will also be interesting because then <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yes. Any other questions? I don't see any more raised hands. I don't know. Arnab, do you have a question or just wave? Oh, no, just wave. Just wave. <laughs> okay, if not, uh, Urna, is there any other question from Silver Jubilee? Uh, no, there are no other questions. Okay, okay. So if not, thank you, uh, Shotoda, once more. Thank you very much. Yes. I'm really sorry I couldn't make it to the uh, SNBO Center. This is yeah, yeah. Uh, we even arranged a good lunch for you. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I really, really sorry. <laughs> I mean, I just can't move. I mean, it's terrible. I and mean, this had to happen exactly at this time. I mean, oh, I'm sorry. I hope it. Do. I mean, you recover soon. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank, you. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. bye.